this evening, in this very holy place on the banks of Mother Ganga, in Rishikesh Himalayas, in the holy Samadhi Mandir of Swami Shivananda Maharajji. My special gratitude to His Holiness Sripad Swami Bhimalanandaji Maharaj for so kindly opening his heart and kindly inviting me to spend time with him and with all of you. Some years ago, I was invited to speak sitting in this same spot by His Holiness Sri Swami Chidananda Saraswati Maharaj. Before the satsang, we sat in a room on little straw mats together. It was the evening, just overlooking the flow of Mother Ganga. And when it was time for the satsang, I asked him, Swamiji, what would you like me to speak on? Oftentimes people give a general subject. Or sometimes they even say, whatever is in your heart. But he was so specific, without a second hesitation, he replied, Speak on the verse of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Trinadapi Suniche na Taror Iba Sehishnuna, Amani na Manadena Kirtaniya Sadahari. It's like he read my mind and my heart because that's my favorite most of all verses, of all verses. And then he translated it. He said, only if one is more humble than a blade of grass, more tolerant than a tree, eager to offer all respect to others and expect no respect for oneself, only then can one taste the sweetness of Krishna's name? Speak on that verse. So, in his memory and at his feet, I will speak on that verse again, with your permission, Swamiji. <clears throat> in the Srimad Bhagavatam, there's a beautiful verse. Krishna Varnam Tvisa Krishnam Sango Parsana Parsadam Yajai Sankirtana Praya Yajanti Hishumedasha. That in the age of Kali, Krishna comes not in a blackish form like he did in Vrindavan, but he comes with a light golden complexion. And he comes in order to um, spread the Sankirtan of the chanting of Krishna's names. And those who have good intelligence will take to this chanting. It doesn't specifically say golden there, but in another place, in the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, 
Garga Muni, during the birth ceremony of Krishna, he told Nanda, Krishna's father, he said, your son has come in a white complexion, in a red complexion, in a golden complexion, and now he's coming in a black complexion. So the great Acharyas have understood that that golden complexion in the age of Kali was Sri Chaitanya. Radha Bhava Duti Subalitam Nomi Krishna Swarupam. In our tradition, we believe that Lord Chaitanya is Krishna who, ki who came with the Mahabhav, the love of Radha. And he came to distribute that love to the whole world through this simple process of the chanting of God's name. And he wrote eight verses called Shikshastakam. The first verse, Cheto Dharapana Marajanam Bhava Mahadavagni Nirvapana. He's explaining that the mind is like a mirror. When you look in a mirror, what do you expect to see? Yourself. But if that mirror has been neglected for a long time, and you've allowed layers and layers of dust, dirt, pollution to completely cover the mirror. When you look in the mirror, all you see is that dirt. And you think, that's me. And that's the situation of us in this world today. We have forgotten who we really are. Krishna tells in Gita that the, the true self is the Atma, that is without birth, that is without death. We are not these bodies, we are not these minds, we are in our bodies and in our minds. We are the witness. And the nature of that witness is Satchit Ananda, eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. Mamaivam so jivaloke jivabhuta sanatana. Krishna tells in Gita, all living beings, that source of life which is sacred within everyone, Krishna says, is part of me. When we clean the dust from the mirror of our mind, we see our own divinity. We see that our natural potential is to love God unconditionally, to be an instrument of God's compassion in every situation of life. That's who we are. And that's anandam buddhivardhanam pratipadam punam ritasvadhanam. It's that experience, that happiness of loving and being loved. That's the, that's the joy that everyone is seeking. Param Vijayate Sri Krishna Sankirtana. The purpose of this kirtan, this japa, is to awaken that love within us. Then in the second verse, Sri Chaitanya explains, Nam Nama Kari Bahuta Nija Sarva Shaktis. <clears throat> My dear Lord, you have appeared in many forms throughout history. Yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata. The Gita tells that whenever there is a rise in irreligion and a decline in religion, the supreme absolute truth, the one absolute param sattvam, comes to this world to reveal his message, Sanatan dharma. You have many names that have been revealed throughout history in various spiritual traditions. And in each and every one of these names, you have invested all of your beauty, your sweetness, your power, and your compassion. And then in the next verse, the verse that Swami Chidananda Maharaj asked me to speak, I am thinking tonight also, Trinada Pisunichena. 
that in order to chant these holy names and get the true effect, we should practice a life of humility, tolerance, forgiveness, giving honor and respect to others, in other words, without ego. <clears throat> we can compare it that the seed of love, the bhakti lata bij, is within the heart of everyone. This chanting of God's names, satsang with holy people, meditation and seva, it's like water that we place on that seed. But these qualities of humility, forgiveness, tolerance, is like a fertile soil, which allows the seeds to get deep roots and to grow, and to provide the fruits of praying or ecstatic love for the pleasure of all beings. to be humble like a blade of grass. How many of us step on grass? Do we ever apologize and say, oh, I'm sorry for stepping on your head? We don't even think of the grass. The grass is, in, is in taking such an insignificant, humble position. And every time we step on the grass, whether it's a male or a female, or a rich person or a poor person, whether it's a human or a cow or a donkey or an elephant, whoever steps on the grass, the grass goes down and then comes up for somebody else to step on. To be humble like a blade of grass, without a sense of prestige. And then the example is of a tree. <clears throat> What is the tolerance? What is the nature of a tree? The, need, the tree loves to serve, according to this analogy. In the summer, when the blazing sun is beating upon the tree, the tree is giving shade to you and me. In the cold, when the tree is covered with ice, the tree is giving its wood to keep us warm. A mango tree. In some places, it only rains for three or four months a year. And then there's not a drop of rain until the next monsoon season. The mango tree is standing in the blazing heat of the summer. Usually mangoes come in the month of May, which is the hottest season. It hasn't got a drop of water in about seven months. And yet it's providing hundreds of juicy, nutritious, delicious mangoes for us to quench our thirst. And even if you chop down the tree and take its life, it gives its wood so that we can build a house for our life. That is the quality of a tree. To be eager to offer respects and honor to others. This is a divine attribute and not to demand it or expect it for oneself. In giving, we receive. <clears throat> when we find our joy in respecting others, nothing can interfere with our happiness. But when we take our joy in other people respecting us, then hundreds and thousands of things could interfere with our happiness. When we take our pleasure in giving, we can always give. I'd like to tell one of my favorite most stories on this subject. 
with your permission, Swamiji. <laughs> when Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was a young boy, he hid his divinity, his identity of Krishna. He played the role of a student. Thank you. And his name was Nimai. The reason he was born under a neem tree, that neem tree is still there in Navadweep. And because he was born under the tree, his mother, Sachi Devi, named him Nimai. When he was a boy, he was doing his studies and he was such a good student. Every day, he would walk <clears throat> to this island of Navadweep named Simantidweep. It's a very beautiful story where Parvati, the consort of Shiva, was living there. But we'll tell that another time. He would walk down a little dirt path and alongside that pathway, sitting on the ground with a little price of burlap, was a fruit seller. His name was Sridhar. He didn't have much fruit to sell. He would somehow or other get some banana bark to sell or sometimes banana leaves to sell for people to use as plates. Sometimes he'd have a banana root. And when he was really lucky, he would actually have some bananas. Nimai would come to him every day. Sridhar was so materially poor. He had practically nothing. And whatever little bit of money he would get from selling his banana articles, the first thing he would do is he would worship his beloved Krishna by doing puja to Mother Ganga. Half of his income would go to Ganga Puja. And whatever was left, he would somehow or other maintain his family. And he was a very peculiar type of businessman, you may say. Because usually a business person will think about how could I get the most possible profit from what I have. Yes? <clears throat> he was just the opposite. He was so concerned with his customers. He would calculate in his mind and offer prayers, how could I make the least amount of profit and survive so that everybody else could be happy? It describes in Sri Chaitanya Bhagavat, he was as honest as Maharaj Yudhisthira, the eldest brother of the Pandavas. <clears throat> so little Nimai would come. He had beautiful golden complexion, lotus-like eyes. He had blackish hair that, that curled around his moon-like face. And he was very, just a boy. And he would say to Sridhar, how much is your bananas? And Sridhar would give the fairest minimal price possible. And Nimai would say, I will give you half. He'd say half. How will I survive? And they would argue about the price of bananas. And ultimately, Nimai would just say, actually, I will just take them for free. And then he would pick them up. And Sridhar said, oh, take them, take them. One day, Nimai came, and as they were arguing over the price of bananas, Nimai said, why do you worship Krishna? What is he doing for you? Look, at there are people who are atheists, there are people who are worshiping other devas, and they have money, and they have houses, and they have clothes, and they have fine foods. Krishna is giving you nothing. Look at you. And Sridhar said, I have everything I want. Nimai, he said, look at your clothes. 
you have one set of clothes. And they're really old. And you keep them clean. You wash them every day. <clears throat> but there's so many holes in them. And you don't even have enough money for needles and thread. Wherever there's holes, you just tie a knot to close it. And look at your body. It's so th thin from hunger. And your house. It's a one tiny room straw hut. And when it rains, the rain comes in. And you don't have any pots or any furniture. Nothing's in there. <clears throat> Why do you worship Krishna? And Sridhar smiled. He said, in my life, I have come to learn that a king, he has the finest clothes, beautiful jewels, eats the finest foods, lives in a massive palace, and a little bird. A bird lives in a grass nest, just eats berries, and only has one set of clothes, which is his feathers, never even changes. But as far as I see, they're both basically passing their life in the same way, sometimes enjoying, sometimes suffering, and they all get what they need. I don't see a difference between the bird and the king as far as the quality of their lives. He said, I may not have a lot of everything, but I'm happy. I'm happy just loving Krishna and serving Krishna and chanting Krishna's names. And Sri Chaitanya said, he has a little boy, Nimai. He said, Sridhar, you are hiding your real wealth. You are the richest man in all of Navadweep, this town. You have such a treasure, but you keep it hidden. You are cheating us. Sridhar said, whatever you see is what I am. I'm not hiding anything. Nimai said, someday I am going to reveal your treasure. Then he took his bananas. Interestingly, Sri Chaitanya Bhagavat, where this beautiful narration takes place, Sridhar, he didn't know Nimai was his Krishna, because Nimai was hiding. But he loved Nimai just like he loved Krishna. And he would sit on the side of the road crying in, in his yearning for little Nimai to come. And if Nimai was late, he would just be fixed, his eyes on the, on the dirt path. When is he coming? When is he coming? And when he would come, Nimai, out of his love for Sridhar, would argue the price of bananas for two hours every day. And in this way, he was giving his darshan to his devotee. It was a secret. And Nimai, when he would go home, he told his mother, I will never eat any food unless it is served on a leaf plate that was given by Sridhar. Years later, Nimai went to Gaya. And there he met his guru, Ishwara Puri. And at that point, because he wanted to show the world, Sri Chaitanya was Krishna who appeared in the form of a devotee to teach how to be a devotee. So until he got the blessings and the grace of a guru, he didn't manifest the ecstasies of his love. And when he did, he came back to Navadweep and he was so humble. He just wanted to serve everyone. He would wash people's clothes. He would walk. He would, if they saw them carrying something heavy, he would carry it home for them. But on one special occasion, because the very, very intimate devotees there recognized that he was Krishna, they always wanted to worship him as Krishna. But he never allowed it. But there's a beautiful Leela 
called Mahaprakash. In the house of Srivas, Nimai, Sri Chaitanya, wanted to fulfill all of his devotees' innermost desires. And he was revealing himself exactly according to that devotee's worship. There was a devotee named Murari Gupta, who was an Ayurvedic doctor with wife, children, who was a devotee of Ram. And Lord Chaitanya revealed to them, Ram, Lakshman, Sita, Hanuman. To, Hadi, to, to Haridas Thakur, he revealed his beautiful form of Krishna. And while these devotees throughout the whole night were enjoying these ecstasies, and to each devotee he was saying, ask any benediction. I will give you anything and everything you want. And he had the power to give. And then he said something that really um, shocked everyone. He said, bring Sridhar. Nobody even knew who Sridhar was. He was so insignificant, <laughs> socially. Whoever lived in the area where he was, they didn't even know his name. They just called him Kolavecha, which means the banana seller. And, and, and the devotee said to, to, to Goranga, Lord Chaitanya, who is the Sridhar? Where does he live? He said, you just go that direction towards Simantadvip. Because it was night, he chants Krishna's name all night long. Just go there and listen for the chanting and you will find him. So they went to his little one room, earth floor, straw hut. And they said, Lord Chaitanya, Goranga, he wants to see you. He wants to see me. Why me? They brought him. Goranga was sitting on a beautiful seat. He said, Sridhar, ask for any benediction and I will give it to you. Sridhar said, I don't want anything from you. I just want to serve you. And then Lord Chaitanya manifested his form of Krishna, standing beside Balaram, his brother, in the forest of Vrindavan. Sridhar actually saw the Yamuna River, the Kadamba trees, the Tamil trees, so many cows and gopis and gopas and Krishna and Balaram. And he fainted in ecstasy. Then Nimai touched him and picked him up and said, I want to give you any benediction you desire. Sridhar said, I really don't want anything. The Lord said, you're so poor. I will give you a beautiful home. I will give you your own property. Now you don't even have your own property. You're living on someone else's land. I'll give you a palace if you like. I'll give you the wealth of Indra, the king of heaven. Just ask, ask. Sridhar said, that will just be a disturbance. I don't want those things. The Lord said, then I will give you Elevation to the heavenly worlds. He said, I have no interest in that. The Lord said, I will give you the perfection of all the eight mystic yogic cities. Anima, Manima, Prapti. You will be able to become small or big. You will be able to create whatever you want. You will be able to travel to other planets. You will be able to read people's minds. I will give you all the eight mystic cities, even what the devas cannot attain. Just ask, ask. Sridhar said, mystic yogic cities. 
That will just be a disturbance to me. I don't want it. He said, I will give you mukti, liberation. No more suffering, no more birth, no more death. Ananda, the ecstasy of eternal peace. Sridhar said, my Lord, I don't want to ask that from you. I will give you elevation to Vaikuntha, to the Lord's eternal abode. You can be his eternal loving associate. Please ask. Sridhar said, I only want to be the servant of the servant of your servants. I don't desire any of these things. Lord Goranga said, please ask for something. Sridhar said, please be peaceful, my Lord. <laughs> and the Lord said, I am peaceful. <laughs> he said, if you want to serve me, then ask for something, because I want to give you something. Please listen carefully. Sridhar said, if it pleases you that I ask for something, I have one desire. In that little form of Nimai, forevermore, please come to steal my banana. Let this meditation on your beautiful childhood form of Nimai coming to steal my bananas, let that forever be in the core of my heart. I want nothing else but to please you and serve you, my Lord. At that point, Sri Chaitanya was weeping and everybody else in the room was weeping. Lord Chaitanya kept his promise. He revealed the secret treasure of Sridhar, the greatest of all pressures, Prem, ecstatic love. And Lord Chaitanya said, I give you this benediction that I am a prisoner of your love. You have conquered me by your love. And you will always remember Krishna and never forget Krishna. And whoever even hears the story of your love will get Krishna's blessing. Not long ago, just last year, I was invited to speak at the House of Lords in the British Parliament in London. I gave a speech for some time, but one line I spoke, people gave me an ovation. Me. Actually, I came to Rishikesh the same age as Swamiji Bhimalananda Maharaj. I just had turned 20, coming out of 19 years old. That was in 1970. Swamiji came in 1953. And I met Swami Chidananda Saraswati, who showered his blessings upon me. And I, for some time I lived at the Divine Life Mission. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Should I end here, or should I, do I have a few more minutes? A few more minutes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you are gracious and generous, thank you. So while I was there, I don't have much education. I left home after one semester of college and told my mother and father I will be back in two months to continue college. But I never came back. I ended up hitchhiking from London to the Himalayas where I lived here and I traveled around. 
and ultimately came to my guru, Srila Prabhupada, in the path of bhakti. So when I was speaking there, lords, ladies, dukes, duchesses, members of parliament, and this little Swamiji I'm sitting there. And one thing I spoke, afterward they were all telling me that really moved me. Just one line. You can understand how rich you are by counting how many things you have that money cannot buy. Because real wealth is what gives us happiness. You could be a millionaire and a billionaire, but you're all, if you're always stressed out and envious and fearful and, and anxiety, what's the use of all that if you're not happy? And if you're not happy, you can't make other people happy. The only thing that can bring happiness to the heart is to give love and to receive love. And money cannot buy that. That's the inherent nature of all of us. Yoga is meant to actually give us a realization of that love, of that peace, of that ananda, that happiness. And whether we're billionaires or simple little sadhus, housewives, teachers, business, politicians, whatever we may be, that's a detail. That love is within us. And when we find that treasure, we are really rich. And when we find that treasure, we could be an instrument of God's love to give so much happiness to the world. Sridhar, he had that love. And even 500 years later, we're still talking about his love and sharing that love. This chanting of God's names and this living with this mood of simplicity without envy or anger. Real yoga is meant to transform us to transform arrogance into humility, to transform greed into generosity, vengeance into forgiveness, indifference to compassion, hate to love, darkness to light, and the struggle against so much suffering into an eternal natural peace and happiness. Through satsang, through seva, through sadhana, harinam, this is the wealth that is within all of us that could be attained. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to share this simple message with you today. Thank you very much.